In that case, I will call to order the work session for March 16th. And our first item is the Downtown Business Association report that will be given to us by Allison Wicks, our development project manager, and uh, Roy Dunnebeck, the uh, current dictator of uh, the downtown. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Mayor Gamba. Uh, so I'm Allison Wicks. I'm the development project manager for the city and kind of the liaison to the DMBA. Um, so I will just hand it over to Roy. I know they've been um, having an interesting time downtown, so I'll let Roy jump into it. Thanks, Mayor Gamble, for the awesome introduction. <laughs> Great to see you, fellow council members. Thank you for having me. As always, it's an honor to be here to share with you a little bit about what our needs are downtown. Um, first, I know how um, how tough it's been for people, and I just want to thank you all who have been really great on your social media platforms and doing everything you can to help generate business for people and help, you know, help struggling businesses survive. So I know how hard you all work to do that. So thank you for that. Uh, it's no secret that businesses are struggling. Um, you know, I'm fortunate inside of my business. I think, I, you know, unlike a lot of other businesses, my business has been doing fairly well. And, you know, I'm pretty thankful for that. But that doesn't mean I'm not here to talk about what other businesses need. Um, I think that that's my job as the you know, president of the downtown Milwaukee business owner to share with you the, the needs. Um, you know, first and foremost, the COVID restrictions are starting to loosen. So that's helpful, right? And now uh, into this next phase, it's time to start thinking about, you know, how do we get back to business as normal? And I know we're still far away and I know there's caution that's needed as well, but there's also, I think, some planning and Allison and Brenna from the events department have started to brainstorm about what that might look like. And I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts here in just a moment. So there's really two areas that if you think about um, you know, what we could use some help with in um, downtown Milwaukee, the first and foremost is how do we get more people on the streets shopping, right? The right people. I think this is always the question that we ask, right? Is, you know, our businesses in downtown Milwaukee really need pedestrian traffic down there, right? To, to be, you know, sustainable. They, they count on that. I mean, many of our businesses are destinations, but that's not all they thrive on. Right. They thrive on those busy Saturdays or the busy Sundays, you know, whether the market's there or not. And the second is, you know, how do we fill some of the spots that are open? Right. There. I always look at like our kind of our crown jewel of Milwaukee is Axel Tree. And as I drive by every day, I wonder, you know, who is actually going to be the tenant that that uh, fulfills that spot. Right. It's it's real estate that's beautiful. It's, it's ideally located, but it's also expensive. Right. And so, you know, I look to myself and think about like, OK. Okay, you know, when, when those spots are filled with great businesses, I'll, I'll really think that the downtown area is really thriving. And I know that's really what we're all about is how do we make it kind of a, a team approach? I always talk about this in our DMBA meetings is, you know, we're in this together. You know, people shop at each other's businesses as much as anything. And how do we help each other um, sort of survive and thrive? And I think to myself, you know, how do you solve those? you know, those challenges, right? And I think that one of the great ways that Milwaukee has always sort of solved those is through our great events, right? And so as I've talked to Allison and, and Brenna to, you know, start thinking about, okay, you know, it's not safe yet, of course, but, you know, when would it be safe and how do we pull it off? And I think one of the biggest challenges for us as the DMBA is, you know, we lost all our funding, right? We don't have any money right now to put on the, uh, the first Friday events should it, we deem it successful, right? So that's one of the biggest challenges we're dealing with. I know that we kind of thought about, could we do some mini version of the event to get, you know, people sort of led back into some normalcy? Um, so I'd love to hear some thoughts on, on that. Um, you know, we desperately want to use the South downtown uh, structures that the, 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 the town has built, right? We want to take advantage of those. I think they're wonderful. I think we can do a lot with them. I think even during you know, some when the restrictions get to be the point where it's safe, you know, we'd love to be the people who, who put events down there first Friday or whatever the event might be, right? Um, is there any other way maybe that the council can consider um, helping us to throw more events down, down there first Friday or whatever the event might be, right? Um, is there any other way maybe that the council can consider um, helping us to throw more events down there first Friday or whatever the event might be, right? 
way. So those are some things. Is there another way of the council can be announced or helping us to throw more events on their first Friday or whatever they see that be, right? So those are some things. Is there another way? Yeah, definitely. Sean and I actually had, uh, had dinner the other night. I know he's got some ideas about um, bringing events back, and I, you know, I kind of talked to him too about you know we just kind of if we do it as a team event. Um, let's you know let's start working on it. So I'm definitely in communication and love to coordinate with him. Yeah, it's gonna you know we're still um, finding out what the federal money is going to be allowed how we're going to be allowed to use that uh, so we'll know a whole lot more I think the first meeting in April and is that right am I remembering that right yes okay um, and I can you know I can think of a number of ways that we could we could do events uh, to it's actually our study session sir so it'll be the second meeting second, it's second. The study session okay second meeting in April so the second Tuesday in April um, you guys might want to tune in to that. Um, so what, as we're having that conversation, you know, ideas occur to you. Um, but I think there, there might be some opportunity to, to prepare for the moment when, you know, it's deemed safe enough to start really opening things back up, uh, to have, and, you know, we should, that should give us a few months to, to think about that and think about how we can have some events that would sort of help kickstart the whole downtown. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, if money were no object, <laughs> um, I mean, if you had, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what uh, First Friday costs to put on. I guess I'd be curious to know sort of on average what it costs month to month. Um, but if you had that money, do you have the volunteers and the commitment of the businesses to jump in full or on it. Yeah, you uh, asked some great questions. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a call through here. That's why I dropped off video for a minute, but I think you can still hear me. Um, the cost of First Friday is roughly about 2000 to 2500 bucks a month to run it. Um, and that's kind of, you know, we could, we've had more in the past, right? really depends on the entertainment. I think that's really where the money comes in, really entertainment and marketing. If I had to kind of break it down, that's what we use our, uh, primarily our money for. But sometimes we have one entertainment act, sometimes we have a couple, right? That's where the, the variation could, could go. So I think in the past, we've run the whole six events off 25,000, maybe it's a little less. I'd have to ask Kelly to look at the budget, but that gives you an idea of what it might take. Um, in terms of volunteers, no, we really haven't had started having the conversations. You know, I had talked to Allison about some of the things I thought that we could really use some help with, and she started brainstorming and thinking maybe we could do a light version, you know, late summer, maybe early fall, even if it was one or two, um, which sort of pro, uh, provided me some thinking about it. So I, I, I think we could put together the volunteers. We could certainly, I think there's tons of people out there, right, the vendors, if we could find a way to keep them safe, that they would be available. I'm, I'm speculating, but I think that that wouldn't be hard to put together. Um, you know, how do we highlight the businesses as well? I think people, um, you know, it's tough, right? You're just trying to run your everyday business and trying to you know, ask our business owners to do any more is a tough ask for me. Um, but, you know, if people see the value in um, participating and, you know, see the first event, I'm sure the second one would be even better. Well, and, uh, sorry, are you, I didn't mean to cut you off, Rory. Oh, I don't know what I was going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sure it was brilliant. <laughs> um, you know, when we talked about um, how we might do Sunday Parkways, or sorry, gosh, I cannot stop saying that. Um, the thingy. My words Carefree are. Sunday. Thank you. Carefree Sunday. Um, we did sort of brainstorm around, uh, you know, the mayor brought up, could we marry this with Porch Fest somehow and um, 
So this just makes me think, well, could we marry it with Porch Fest and have some Porch Fest locations that are downtown on Main Street? Um, and the tension there is, what is the timing of that event? And are we far enough past uh, the, you know, are we far enough into the vaccinations that it would be safe to have uh, less control over how many people show up? You know, because Porch Fest, it was easy to keep those dispersed and have, you know, maybe 20 people show up and stay six feet apart and, and be outside. Um, and I don't know, you know, so much of that is still moving targets. They're getting better, but um, I don't, I don't know that we know enough to answer affirmatively one way or the other on, on whether or not all of those things would line up. But I, that's one thing that seems like it could be super fun and, and a way to get businesses downtown. And, and I bet that the arts committee would be, would love to partner um, with the downtown business association to find some porches um, to have, to have music performances at. I think you hit on some really great points. I mean, there's a couple of things I'm hearing uh, from everyone that's spoken so far. One is we have some resources coming, uh, potentially, um, which is you know great to hear. It doesn't take a lot to put on our events. I think people are dying to put these things on. We have a ton of creativity in this town. I think we can leverage that easily. Um, you know, the part I think that we've maybe struggled with in the past is putting some of these partnerships together, right? Um, you know, Brenna and her role, we really haven't got a chance to, to visit with her, except, you know, me one-on-one. -on -one. You know, how does the city events coordinate with First Friday? Could we, you know, could we all work together? Could Celebrate Milwaukee somehow be involved? They have a lot of resources, right? So I think that we just need to all align our resources and, and figure out how we can work together to help each other put on these successful events. And, you know, if we build it, they, you know, they will come. People will come downtown, I'm sure. But I've seen it on, you know, Sundays. It's by far the busiest day. And I just think to myself, you know, how do we mimic that every day of the week in downtown Milwaukee, right? I mean, people are so, it's packed down here. And then, you know, I look downtown today, you know, and I look and, you know, I can shoot a cannon off downtown. You know, it's just the streets are totally empty. Um, you know, I know businesses just cannot survive with the empty streets. Um, you know, especially during the, the lunch hour, you know, that we don't have enough businesses downtown that are, you know, open for lunch that, um, you know, we can afford to keep these things going. And so, um, you know, I don't know how many businesses will close. My hope is none, right? I mean, I think we all hope that. I think that that's a, you know, maybe a figment of my imagination and my hopes that, you know, I think that some people are gonna continue to struggle. I think that they've been doing a good job of getting the resources to them. Um, I think people have been doing a good job of supporting them in any way, shape, or form. I mean, some of the, I thought that the food carts would be struggling and some of them are thriving. They've just been able to build their business around, you know, the, the, the catering, the, the portable uh, transportation thing. So, you know, it's, it's interesting if you look at just different businesses and how they're doing. Um, but I know we need help. Um, you know, we can't do it alone. You know, the people barely have enough time to participate in the downtown business meetings, let alone any activities that we put on. So those are some of my challenges as I, as I go forward. And, you know, anything that we can do to kind of brainstorm these things
buildings where they blocked off a block of parking and that some of the she got other outside vendors but they could be the downtown businesses it could be like a sidewalk sale kind of a scenario where the downtown businesses offer you know fill a block of parking spaces i mean you don't want to fill too many because the parking for the market is always an issue but um you know there could be some some opportunities like that on sundays um and then weekdays i mean you know a um i have heard that portland parks may be back in the concert in the parks business this summer or at least toward the latter part of summer and maybe concerts on in south downtown there's something lunchtime you know they used to do it in scott park a historic milwaukee and ed zumwalt used to do them in scott park but maybe that's uh, a thing to think about is you know south downtown and the plaza yeah we're definitely trying to leverage that part of town we know that we can we built it and let's use it right so you know i think that will also help with filling axle tree right if we can continue to throw great events down there people will want to have open their business down there right so this sort of two two-prong approach and how to you know how to tackle that um, that challenge there um so i think we're all thinking about the same thing i think you know that i guess the, the takeaway here is that you know i, I can reach out to everyone and see what where we can um link up our resources i think that everyone has a, great, a ton of great ideas and i think we're in the planning phase and we just need to be ready for action i think that's up our resources i think that everyone has a, great, a ton of great ideas and i think we're in the planning phase and we just need to be ready for action i think that's up our resources i think that everyone has a, great, a ton of great ideas and i think we're in the planning phase and we just need to be ready for action that yeah uh, on the committee, I don't really know many other great, great ideas. He is the chair, so he's he's the right person to, to reach out yeah. to. And, and I think just yeah. you know expressing the interest in in creative partnerships with them could be really fruitful because because they love that kind of work and and they love downtown, so they're they're certainly sympathetic um, to the cause. Okay. I'll just add that we extended our. Um, temporary use outdoor seating permits through November of 2021. So um, that's something that the businesses that are currently doing them can continue to do them. And then um, they're great for outdoor seating, but if there's any other kind of created use, creative uses um, or even event-based um, uses for those, um, you know, definitely open to doing those and supporting the downtown businesses. And then um, Rory will definitely follow up with Brenna put our heads together on events. Okay, thanks for your help, that's great. Of course. Good, thanks you too. Well, let's, let's, keep, let's keep working on this and, and try and be ready by the time the vaccines are taking effect. Sure. All right, cool, thank you. Thanks, Rory. Good to see you, Rory. Yeah, good to see you. All right, um, our next item is a capital improvement plan. It's a projects update, and um, I'm not sure whether it's Jennifer Garvey, Steve Adams, or Peter Possibelli that's going to present this. We're all three in tandem. Uh, I'll share my screen, Steve. Is that what you want? Uh, sure, go ahead. I think you're going to get all three of us talking, is the way it's planned out. <laughs> Cool. But not all at the same time, hopefully. That was good. Let me do it. Can you see that? I can. Yeah. All right, Steve, why don't you take it off? We see it with your notes. I don't, it oh. says no notes, but I. Just thought you might want to know that. Okay. Let me see if I can do a quick. Not need. There is no need notes, but we'll just duplicate. There we go. There we go. There you go. You know. Gotcha. All right. Uh, well, as you know, we are getting very busy with capital projects.
projects um, starting off um, and one wrapping up. So, General, we'll get into in the, the general list of, of each one, but uh, Linwood and uh, Lake are ramping up quickly. Uh, and then uh, River 22nd is kind of closing out, but we are also moving forward. What I'm trying to do is develop a system in the staff so as one project goes out to bid, then and the bids are awarded, you usually have some dead time, so you start working on your next project then after that. So even though Tessie's busy with River and 22nd, she's still busy designing wood and working with Beth and designing the Homewood Edison pro project. Uh, Steven's got Lake Road out there, but he's starting design work on uh, the Wastewater 2021 uh, project. Uh, Testy is looking to get going on another project. We're thinking it's going to be Art and Wald North. We're working through that right now. But she, she is in the, the latter stages of the River and 22nd project, too. So the process, hopefully, will start feeling more comfortable with people as we, we as we go through it. We're all pretty new at this, uh, the big project scheme, and, and wrapping up one and get going on the other one. But I think it's starting to, 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 to uh, take shape. All right, so here's River and 22nd, our safe project. Um, I've got to say, they are moving. Um, the great part about this is, I mean, they technically have till October 2021 to finish this project. We're, we're looking at most of it being done in April, which is quite exciting. So water has been completed. The stormwater has been completed. Almost all the curb, there's a few little small sections that were... Um, need to fill in sidewalk is finishing up i believe this week um or next and then then we're kind of going to wait for a little bit because we need weather to do the paving so really we're looking at paving and then all the restoration and landscaping and we're done we're out of there so so great it looks great <laughs> just excellent, <FYI. laughs> yeah. excellent. Go ahead, it does look great. I wanted to bring up one little minor issue just to have it on your radar screen. Sure. Um, which was, um, there's always been a pre COVID, there was always a problem with visitors to the River Roadhouse on busy nights parking in the bike lane on 22nd, sort of in front of where the fences are, in front of that other business on the corner of 22nd and Bluebird. Um, we had that happen. I thought, well, once the new road is done, we won't have that problem. Well, we had it happen last weekend in the nice weather. Um, so I think it'll be just important. I don't know if it's the striping of the bike lanes. I don't know if it's signage actually on the fences about this being a no parking zone, but that is um, that has historically been a problem and it's just something that we should somehow make as obvious as we can that that is not an appropriate mm -hmm. place to park. No, good deal. Yeah. I'll circle back on that. Thank you. Next, Linwood Avenue. Um, if you haven't been down Linwood, we are under construction. So the poles have been moved. PGE has moved all the poles that needed to be moved. Um, they have been delayed uh, due to the last snowstorm. Um, which is understandable, but at the same time is hard because my contractor is out there and we're still moving forward. Currently, right now, they're working on stormwater um, pipe. So they're um, down to one lane and they're flagging through there. They are very aware school is up and starting back up uh, March 29th. So we're preparing with that. We're actually meeting with them tomorrow to discuss with the school on how that's going to work and how can we make it safe and how are we going to get the kids through the construction site and safely to school. Trees have been removed. Um, they're starting to do some clearing and grubbing and um, great contractor solution oriented. Um, but anytime they find an issue, they're trying to figure out how they can help us and get through it um, and really, really want to work with us well. So that's been exciting. All right, Lake Road. <clears throat> so Lake Road, uh, the contractor uh, was supposed to start this week. They backed off a week. So they should be out there next week on the 22nd starting work. So 
you'll start seeing some uh, some things occur starting uh, next week. Uh, again, things are looking pretty good right right now. We've gone over the schedule. We determined that it'll be a one way west on Lake Road, and we're going to hold that for the duration of the project. So if you want to go eastbound, people are going to have to go out Washington or Monroe or Harrison over to 224 or some other way. But uh, the initial one is going to, uh, we're going to do it in phases, so we're kind of looking at taking chunks of the road at a time, but uh, the predominant direction will be one way west on that. Uh, Project completion is scheduled for October 2021. Right now, the schedule calls for the streets to be paved and the sidewalks open by September 1st. So we anticipate schools to get going full bore in the fall, and we certainly hope to have all of that, those key items done. The only things that should be remaining after that are probably like the stormwater quality swales, the plantings, landscaping. The signal pulls might take a while. They're, they're always difficult to order and get in. There's only a couple manufacturers in the U.S. Uh, six months and nine month lag is often seen in ordering signal pulls. So those may be the actual last things installed will be the signal poles out on the north side of Lake and Oldfield. Potentially also the striping would be in September. Um, that might not be completely yes, um, by the time September 1. Um, usually we like about two weeks for the pavement to be down on a cure set and then come through and do all the markings. So, but, but opening it back up. Okay two-way traffic. I have a question. Real yeah. About the, the, the Linwood, because I was down there today and thinking about school opening. Do you know if Linwood is an early start school or a late start school with? You know what? There's actually two schools there. So they have, I think, both. I think they have the typical North Clackamas early start, and then they have a charter school that's, um, I think, close to there as well. But yeah. It's not charter school. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sojourner is at Linwood. I'm just right. like they, they've changed the start times of the schools. And so my school typically was a late start school, but now it's an early start school. So kids will be coming at 730. Mm -hmm. And then at other schools are coming at 830. So. so we're meeting with them tomorrow to figure that all out. Um, I don't know the exact answer for that for that school at this point, but we are meeting with them tomorrow. All right. Thanks. To discuss how we're going to get buses and vehicles and parents all to the school safely, and so it's pretty. It's, that road's pretty wild over there. Yes, it is. We do have a, a benefit off of um, Stanley. You can't access the back of the school, so we're going to talk to them to see how much we can divert to that back to make it a little safer. Um, having people enter and exit um, on the back side. Um, We'll, we'll see if it's a possibility, which it would be. It would be nice, um, and then see if there's any um, we're crossing the road and things like that, because all our fees are down right now. Um, it's it's a mess. A construction site, I should say. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um on future CIP projects, Monroe Street Greenway. Uh, Kelly's been helping out immensely on this because she's our local ODOT knowledge person. So her time at ODOT and knowing who's who and knowing how they work and how they think has been immensely helpful to us in trying to get this prospectus written, trying to make sure ODOT uh, commits to the grants that they have committed uh, we're to the point, we're just about ready to submit the prospectus to ODOT, which kind of is the final step before uh, ODOT will approve it and release the funds for the project. So the submittal of the prospectus is going to happen this month. I honestly don't know how long ODOT takes to review it. I know my own personal experience is that ODOT always is takes more time than I hope they will take. So I don't have a date on when we might be hiring a consultant, but we are pretty close to getting uh, hopefully a done deal with uh, with ODOT. 
Dover McBride Avenue Improvements, we are super close. Um, we are coming to you tonight with a uh, budget um, increase for authorization to cover basically our contaminated soil that we hit um, throughout the water work and a little bit of storm. They will, they're basically under contract to finish by the end of this month um, and then we will pay them out and close that project up. Yes. What the, um, there was also a separate thing in the report we get, the, you know, the monthly that about a driveway issue. What exactly was that? Was that a business not telling us what they really needed? So it was, that get, how does that have to be redone? Yeah. So basically it, um, when we added this sidewalk, it flattened out the driveway a bit and then we had to steepen it a little bit. Um, and when we put this AC back, um, it just didn't work with the really large trucks for delivery. So they got 60 foot trailers on these trucks. They are massive. And, um, and they, these trucks have super low clearance. So in our CAD files, we didn't have that truck. We didn't even, we didn't even realize that truck was, um, you know, there and available. So when we designed it, it wasn't taken into consideration. So instead we pulled it out of this project. We um, got some help with a transportation engineer to help us actually do the right uh, levels and we got the right truck. And so now we've got a design that we're looking pretty good. Um, the, we also needed help from the owner. Like we're making, we had to go further onto the property. So we were trying to stay within the right of way. We can't stay within the right of way. We need to come onto the property to make it work. So um, we'll be hiring um, a contractor to fix that issue along with a water valve that's leaking um, that water department needs. And so we're gonna combine those two items and um, utilize um, a contract, um, a contractor that we've worked well with. We're anticipating it to be done in about April, May, May at the latest. Um, it's paving work, so I want to make sure it's really dry. And we're communicating with the businesses to make sure we can have that shut down and get in there as quickly as possible. We've requested um, three days max. We actually think we can do it in two, um, giving us a little leeway there, just in case if anything goes wrong. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Meek Storm South Base is complete. We can check that one off. Um, trees have been replanted, so now we got live trees and everything. Uh, Meek Storm North Phase. So we've gotten finally the documents from the railroad. We are um, have a few comments we're going to send back, get revised ones sent to us. We'll sign it, and then we'll be coming to you to purchase that property. Once um, we get that signed and ready to go, um, I plan on going out to bid about January 2022. This is a budget that um, leaps over the two budget cycles. So I don't want to start it too early in this season because I don't have enough money. I don't want to stop the contractor. Uh, but the, the project is already, it's designed, it's complete, it's ready to go. So nothing stopping us once we get to that point. 43rd and 42nd Avenue safe. Um, we had a little redesign in the stormwater work. We're hoping um, it's a little more efficient. We're able to use infiltration a bit more, which saves us money on piping and size. Um, and so that redesign, we needed a little bit of time to get that. So we're getting close. I anticipate April going out to bid for that project. Um, very excited. Homewood Edison Safe, we are at a 60% um, right now. And the hard part about um, home and wood is the roadways. They are definitely in worse condition than we anticipated. So we're trying to figure out how we can stretch our dollars, do the best repair we can, but we are putting a pretty good sized Band-Aid on our roads. Um, I think Steve and I will be talking to you again and. May, I believe, um, about SSMP and program and safe and seeing what we can do there. Waste 
wastewater improvement projects um, is under design. So um, Stephen's chugging away on those, and we anticipate that going out to bid um, kind of early summer. So you should see that coming through soon. All right, let's see if this video works. Um, I wanted to show you. This was put together um, for Cromberg Park. Uh, originally there's a clear line of sight there 
but in the future with the Monroe Apartments um, being constructed, uh, we won't have that clear line of sight. So we have to change out the uh, the radios that we're going to uh, use for that piece there and have uh, use a different radio. But uh, good thing we caught we caught that before we we constructed it. So. Um, so right now, I expect those uh, phases, the communications and field automation phase to go out for bid here. The late spring, maybe the early summer, um, you know, the surge in COVID over, over November, December, and January made it difficult for uh, Tetra Tech to do some of the field work that they need to do. So they're working on getting caught up on that. Um, but I, I anticipate that that project's going to be completed in the late summer, early early fall of this year. Uh, one of the other things we're getting ready to do is have some workshops uh, to develop the SCADA objects. So you can see a screenshot of the SCADA system there. It looks there's lots of uh, lots of parts there. We're going to try to develop uh, through these workshops a cleaner screen that that's more. Uh, more streamlined and easy to follow the follow the process. So we'll have some workshops internal ones with our uh, public works staff to, to lay those out as they're developing uh, the SCADA software. Any any questions on that? All right. Uh, next slide. So our well number two project, uh, we started that back in September. Uh, the fires put us back a little bit. The contractor wasn't able to, to get some of the work done uh, early on because of some of their staff had to evacuate. So that put us a little bit behind. Um, but currently we have the, the, the slab poured, the concrete stem wall that the masonry block building is gonna sit on poured. The contractor is expecting to start that masonry work, uh, I think on Thursday. We've got a cons uh, considerable amount of the electric work done that relates to how we're going to switch power over from the current well that we have to the new well and to make sure that as we're uh, constructing the new well, we'll still, or putting in the pumps and connecting things that we can still use the old well. They've done that work. Our pump and motor for the well, um, one of the things that we're looking at doing Generally, you do factory testing with the pump and the motor on site at the factory in case there's a problem. Uh, but because we have such a long lead time on this, we're going to, the, the contractors asked that we uh, skip the factory testing and they will take the motor and the and pump and do uh, testing here in the field to make sure that we don't have any issues and that the pump meets all of the, the pump curves. Uh, it puts some risks risk on the contractor uh, on the contractor in case there is an issue with uh, the motor or the pump. Uh, but we're trying to do this to sort of streamline and speed up the process. I, I do anticipate the project's going to be done though by by early August. Uh, and well number two, uh, Councilman Nicodemus, this is at at, at the intersection of 40th and Harvey uh, near the elevated water storage tank that we have at Water Tower Park. On the southwest side of that intersection, we have uh, our upper treatment plant water complex, and we're, we're drilling a new well there uh, to replace the older well that had a cracked case. All right. Our, our master plans, uh, we've developed the system models. Uh, the, the consultants have ran those models and put together some chapters for uh, future projected loadings and demand for both the water and the wastewater. Uh, and now, based off of those those demands, they are in the process of, of refining the project lists as they relate to infrastructure needs for to meet future growth. Uh, as well as other projects that we've identified during the process, uh, infrastructure projects that relate to, um, you know, maintenance and, and system improvements that are separate from uh, growth and capacity requirements. Um, 
we did have our uh, sub-consultant on the wastewater master plan here this earlier this month to, to, to give a presentation on on the SDC analysis. I, I think we had a good dialogue on that. And they're going to use the, the information uh, that they gathered from the discussion that we have uh, to develop uh, some alternatives for the wastewater SDCs and use that to, to put together that analysis. I do expect to have a draft uh, of each of these plants done the wastewater SDCs and use that to, to put together that analysis. I do expect to have a draft uh, of each of these plants done the wastewater SDCs. Uh, and then, so I, I would expect this summer uh, that we'll, we'll have some discussions about the, the master plants uh, bringing it back to council. Any any questions sessions about the, the master plans uh, bring it back to council? If one other project that I, I, I did want to bring up and I, I didn't get it into a slide, uh, but we are going to do a slurry sale project this summer uh, throughout throughout the community. About one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars is what we have budgeted, so it's probably about half the size of what we did uh, in two thousand and nineteen. So. You know, two and a half to three miles worth of streets that we're gonna that we're gonna hit. There's some coordination that we're gonna need to, to closely manage as it relates to uh, the Lake Road project. I think 34th and 37th, uh, those two streets coming off of Lake Road are gonna get slurry sealed. So we'll have to to, to closely manage that with uh, the engineering staff to make sure that we've got that traffic control and traffic flow coordinated. The slurry still generally takes, it's, it's one day where we really don't want somebody driving on it. So it does make some people park in different areas. And, um, yeah, so there's some complexity there that we'll have to closely manage. Lisa? You're, you're muted. Glad to hear that there's a slurry seal project this summer that had come up in my conversations a couple of times over the winter about road conditions um, and the projects. Um, I think I uh, just picking up on what Jennifer said earlier about home and wood being in worse condition than we thought and needing more than we thought, I guess I wondered what that means about our, um, you know, our inventory and assessment tool that we use and uh, are more roads in worse shape where slurry ceiling is not enough than we think, I guess is my question. And it may not be for you, Peter, it may be more for Stephen, Jennifer, I don't know, but um, it's just curious well, I, about I would say, our opportunity to do slurry sales on on streets are limited to the condition of of the existing pavement structure so you know we're trying to do the slurry seal on the pavements that have a much higher pavement condition index uh, and trying to maintain the road um, and, and prevent it from deteriorating right so it's really sort of a maintenance piece but we have a lot of streets and i know Steve's mentioned this before that are past the maintenance phase that we're doing a lot of reconstructive reconstruction instead of just plain overlays. Yeah, and this this will be a big topic in May when I come with the SAFE and SSMP report. Uh, I've been talking to Kelly about it quite a bit the last several months. Jen's aware of it. Um, and there's only so much money, so we need, we'll need to discuss more and figure out how to approach some of these projects and and make investment decisions on what streets are really worth keeping in great condition and which ones, what we're going to do with the other ones. But yeah, it's a, it's a it'll be a pretty in depth discussion to me. And also, I think I have the Kronberg Park the the drone available if I can obtain a, the share screen capability. You can have it, Steve. You, you're co-host, Steve, so you should be able to share. OK. 
Okay. I think that's the one. Let's hope. And uh, does anyone see the? Not yet. No, we see you. All right. Let's try this again. I hit it. Hit it twice. What's going to take? There you go. All right. I'll play. be a co-host house. Software City Recorder. And Donna, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. She's trying to, yep. There I am. There you go. <laughs> Hi, my name is Donna Baton, and I uh, represented uh, the historic Milwaukee uh, neighborhood in the Liverman Committee. Uh, happy to do it. Great, thank you. Um, so the three of us are here tonight to give an update and share a final report on the work of the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee. Uh, 
Uh, we were last in front of you in October 2020, where we shared an update on the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee work to date. Um, this afternoon, we'll cover our kind of overall project timeline, give an overview of the public engagement um, work to date, um, share about our City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee meetings since we've had since October, meetings four and five, um, and share the kind of the overall purpose of this group, which was the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee proposed goals for the future use of our City Hall building. Um, I'll also talk about the transaction structures for the request for proposals, or um, this is the different ways the city could choose to lease or sell the City Hall building. So to start off, I wanted to review um, how the two our two city hall projects align with each other. Um, so our process for finding a new user for our current city hall is as follows. Um, over the past year, we've been conducting um, public engagement and that can, will continue throughout the project, but we've um, worked with the city hall Blue Ribbon Committee um, and the results of that work is the um, proposed goals that we'll be talking about today. Um, the steps in the disposition of the City Hall building include um, hosting a public hearing and declaring the property surplus, um, and then the City will um, issue a request for proposals and select a new user. Um, all of these will occur within kind of our leased back period of the Advantis building. Um, so at about the same time that the City opens our new City Hall, a new user of our current City Hall will be able to take possession in um, 2023. Uh, when the City Council set up the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee, we reviewed the IAP2 public participation spectrum and landed on public engagement activities that range from the inform to the collaborate level for the public's role in the public participation process. Um, so the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee represents that collaborate level. Um, they've partnered with the city and formulated a recommendation, but the ultimate decision making still lies with City Council. Um, other public engagement tools that we've used include um, web website updates, pilot articles, exercises on Engage Milwaukee, and these represent, represent the inform, consult, and involve um, portions of the spectrum. And I'll hand it over to Scott to talk a little bit about the committee itself. Great. Thank you, Allison. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we had a real all-star of Milwaukee folks on this committee, uh, representing most of our seven neighborhoods and our downtown businesses and uh, other groups such as the Historical Society, the North Clackamas School District Board, uh, the Park and Recreation Board, uh, and the Planning Commission. And we had we were lucky enough to have two members of council at various times, uh, Wilda, former member of council and Councillor Falconer. So we can't speak enough uh, thanks to these folks, Donna included, and uh, it was a real collaborative, real, um, real good discussion, real honest and open and, and real informative. So it was a great group. And uh, as we reported earlier, but just to touch base again, and I'm gonna, Zoom in so I can remember what I have supposed to read. But uh, uh, the group adopted, the committee adopted a charter, which uh, set about the lines that council gave direction to when they formed the committee. Uh, basically, a lot of learning. A lot of learning was done, especially front loading. Our first three meetings were heavy on uh, hearing about operation maintenance of the building, financial requirements the city had, historic preservation. We learned about the history of the site, and, and then we heard from the state historic preservation office about requirements and um, discussed a uh, related issue related to the, the deed restriction that's on the site um, uh, from the school district. And then we have, we heard fascinating, we had Jerry Johnson and Sarah Daly talk to us about the Portland metropolitan real estate market, which was admittedly in 2020, so things have probably changed, but it was still just fascinating to hear about. Uh, and then uh, we went out to do public engagement online, as Allison said. We received a lot of feedback from the community uh, on Engage Milwaukee, and we, the committee then took that information at its meeting in January, meeting number four, and reviewed the data there, and Allison's gonna touch on that in a second, and then started to draft goals, really got into the work. We did some breakout sessions in January, 
and then I'll talk a little more about what we did our last meeting uh, in the future slide. But uh, we've we've had a great a great amount of fun doing this, and it's a, a good group to work with. And our only regret is uh, that little thing called the pandemic, which prevented all of this from happening in person and on those first Fridays and at those markets, which we can all agree would have been so much more enjoyable. But it was good for what we were doing. So, and here's an outline of our schedule. And so you see, we've had five meetings with the group, did public engagement. And I think uh, we've touched on what comes next and we'll touch on a little bit more here in some future slides. Um, so in uh, mid-November, we launched the Engage Milwaukee online open house for the City Hall project and it was live um, through mid-January. Um, I wanted to show this image, I think it's so interesting that um, this peak in December of hits on the page um, was when the December pilot was released. Um, so the City Hall Open House was one of our first two projects up on the Engage Milwaukee page. So it's great to see it get so much attention. Um, on the page, we had um, a survey and an ideas exercise um, that asked community members to share their values for the future of City Hall. Um, we also had 178 people subscribe to the page. So these are people that will get notifications and um, future project updates. So it's awesome to see this level of interest from, from the community in the project. So I touched on uh, meeting number four earlier, um, but the committee got the chance back in January to review this data. And then we did breakout groups to start formulating the goals. And for meeting number five, um, we had we gave the committee another opportunity to review, to chew on their their draft goals for a month, and then revisit it. And uh, uh, Allison presented, and we discussed the group discussed the transaction structures, which she'll get to in a little bit in, in a moment. But the the real fun, not that that wasn't fun, but the real fun. <laughs> of that uh, meeting number five was we did a prioritization exercise and then uh, we have a slide coming up to kind of help and it says it in the staff report too i think but uh, that was fun every member was you know essentially given 100 points uh, and then divided up amongst the five five goals or six whatever the number was to divide it up and and everyone got a chance to speak and, and say what they're thinking and it was about the exercise but really it was an excellent moment for each member to weigh in on, on the project and then the, on the site in general, and wait where they think the priority should be. And it, it was it was a tremendous. It was probably the best discussion. They've all been good discussions, but it was a really great discussion. So uh, then the final piece of business they they took care of before they finished. They um, selected Donna and April Grax, uh, who are, who's from the Island Station neighborhood and has been on the City Hall Blurman Committee, uh, to be the committee's members on the request for proposal process that Allison touched on. That'll be later this year. Donna and April will be the Two members of the evaluation committee and then uh, we also picked uh, or selected donna to help us today to present the final report um so the city hall blue Ribbon committee is proposing um, five goals to city council for your consideration um and i'll just go through these quickly so a project that um, creates a destination a project that's an anchor for downtown milwaukee a destination that attracts both local and local residents and regional visitors um, historic preservation a project that maintains the historic character defining features of the exterior of the building facade a minority women business enterprise contracting, so a project that makes a good faith effort to utilize um, minority women business enterprises in contracting. Uh, sustainable practices, a project to, that uses sustainable and energy efficient design and construction methods, and a project that maintains open spaces and or trees on the property. Um, and as Scott noted with that prioritization exercise, um, this is sort of the order of uh, priority that the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee gave these goals. Um, but I also like to think of it as um, a spectrum. So if the request for proposals um, score sheet that our evaluation committee is using, um, 
they would be able to score each project kind of based on how well they're going to perform on each of these goals. So um, maybe creates a destination and historic preservation are each given 30 points out of 100, um, and you're you're scoring it based on um, you know how how well each project meets one of these goals. Um, so that's a little bit in the weeds, but I'm always thinking about how these pieces fit into our future request for proposals document. Um, so I'll also just run through um, a piece about kind of transaction structures um, and public benefits and some hot topics, and then we'll um, kind of dive into questions and comments from council. Um, so an important piece that we reviewed with the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee um, is transaction structures. Um, when we release the request for proposals, we'll ask respondents to identify their preferred transaction structure. Um, and I anticipate um, three categories of responses or types of responses that we could get. Um, so one is that a a new user who wants to more or less use the building as is and would prefer to lease the building. Um, so for example, that would be a nonprofit user who would use the building as an office um, and wouldn't need to make any major changes. Um, and then the best fit for that is that they would um, lease the building. Um, kind of two other potential future users <laughs> um, would need to, um, so one type would be one that would needs to renovate the space for their use. Um, so this was, for example, um, a bar, restaurant, event space. Um, in this case, the respondent to the, um, the request for proposals would identify that they want to purchase the building. Um, a third type of new user would be one who wants to renovate the building um, and then maybe build an addition or build an additional building on site. Um, for example, someone who wants to build apartments um, adjacent to City Hall and that would, um, we would also then expect the, for the proposer to want to purchase the building. So those are kind of the three types of future uses and the two types of transaction structures that we consider. Um, if a respondent wants to purchase the building, um, but not offer any public benefits to the city, we then undergo uh, a market rate sale of the building. Um, so we would appraise the property and then sell it at market rate. Um, if a respondent did want to offer public benefits on the site, then the city would consider a land value write down based on those public benefits, kind of similar to um, the COCO project. Um, so types of public benefits um, could include kind of going above and beyond um, on historic preservation or um, maintaining public access to open spaces. Um, uh, maybe participating in city events, or if it's a, a nonprofit user of the site, um, or other public benefits um, as negotiated by city council. So it could be a whole range of things that we think are worth um, a write down in the value of the land. Um, also, wanted to touch on a few key questions that we often get from the community. Um, so one is, what part of the building will be saved? Um, I'll say that this is kind of a layered question, but there's at least um, two layers of historic preservation um, rules in place, um, one at the local level and one at the state level that'll help um, guide this process. Um, so the building is in the city of Milwaukee's historic overlay zone. So any significant changes to the exterior of the building will have to be approved by planning commission. Um, and this allows changes to the interior of the building um, without review by planning commission. Um, kind of the second level of um, regulations around historic preservation is the State Office of Historic Preservation. Um, they'll require a review when a building like City Hall leaves public ownership. Um, so once a project is, devi is defined, uh, the State Office of Historic Preservation will review the adverse effects uh, and will negotiate mitigation with the city and the new user. Um, that being said, neither of these regulations prohibit um, major changes or even um, prevent uh, the building from being torn down, but they are um, checks on our, our process for the building. Um, the, what about the historic deed restriction? 
Um, so as you know, there's a historic deed restriction on the property from 1937 um, from the entity that preceded the North Clackamas School District. Um, we spoke to the North Clackamas School District, I believe it was the winter of 2019 or like November 2019. And um, from that conversation, we have had um, Tori McVeigh, who is a, a North Clackamas School District board member on the City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee. Um, so our next step with the deed restriction is to bring our kind of goals back to um, the North Clackamas School District, which has nothing else important going on right now, <laughs> and talk to them about, um, you know, the, the next steps for the um, removing the historic deed restriction on the property. Um, and then finally, we had some questions in our last meeting about um, if it's possible to move um, the pickle tree or the tree that we use in the tree lighting ceremony. Um, so we spoke with Julian, the city of Milwaukee forester, and he shared with us that um, moving a large tree is an expensive endeavor because um, you also need to move a large root ball. So you have to both remove a large amount of soil and have a large hole in which to place the tree. Um, so it's an expensive operation that includes heavy machinery in small areas downtown and there's no guarantee that the tree would survive a transplant like this. So um, city staff has had some conversations about maybe planting a new tree for future tree lighting ceremonies, but that's another one of the kind of hot, hot topic questions that we've gotten recently. Well, I can I ask, a, yeah. Allison, if you don't mind, because there was a related question, um, you know, sort of in lieu of removing the pickle tree, there was a question about uh, splitting the lot and saving the pickle tree. Um, so can you please talk to that? I think that is really tied to the historic deed restriction. And so if we're able to have the deed restriction removed from um, the property, then that's sort of what's driving the um, conversation about creating a separate parks parcel. So I think our next step is really a conversation with the North Clackamas Parks District. Or sorry, North Clackamas School District. Um, so our next steps is kind of after we get feedback on the goals from council is to do another um, engagement activity on Engage Milwaukee, um, meet with the North Clackamas School District, and then hopefully um, move forward with the request for proposals process in later in 2021. Lisa, it looked like maybe you're going to ask a question. <laughs> I have, yeah, I have several questions. Um, one, back on the tree idea, um, you know, I, I, I think it, you know, that's, yeah, I can't even imagine trying to spend money to move that tree. It doesn't seem like it's in the best of health anyway. Um, but, you know, there's long been a conversation about um, having the big tree on the riverfront in Milwaukee Bay Park be our lit tree and the tree we have a lighting ceremony for. Um, Peter did some investigation of the costs of that and it was pretty hefty, but um, but certainly an, an option that we should think about. Um, you know, I, I guess an option would also be, depending on who the, any future user is still having it, like you said, one of the bonus things could be participation in city events and still letting that tree be lit for a, um, for a Christmas event. Um, it does seem to me that the, uh, uh, I don't know where a tree could go on the property of the, the new city hall, but maybe we should be thinking ahead and planting some trees down there, taking out some pavement and planting some trees. Um, I guess um, one question I had was, I saw something in the notes about splitting off, and maybe this goes to the same question um, you, you just addressed, Allison, about a separate uh, lot for park space, is separating off the sculpture garden. Um, 
So, I mean, that's one potential, I guess, is trying to create a lot that maintains the sculpture garden and maintains the tree. If that doesn't happen, what is the plan for the sculpture garden? Uh, I think it's something that's still up for discussion, but could certainly be relocated or, or moved. Um, I did want to get, before we get too far down in questions, I did want to give a chance um, for Donna to speak a little bit about her experience. Hi. Um, again, my name is Donna Baton, and I, I live in Axel Tree Apartments right downtown. Um, I also own a, a local business, so I was able to bring that perspective to this uh, committee as well. Um, like Scott said, the only thing, the only disappointment in the meeting is that the, meet, the committee is that we were supposed to start meeting last March in person. And we put it off for a couple of months thinking that this shutdown, you know, the shutdown was going to be two weeks and then it was going to be this. And so we ended up finally saying, never mind, we'll just meet on Zoom, which was fine. The, the Zoom meetings were um, very well organized, very well attended, uh, very well run. Uh, it, it was as good as it could be. I know everybody's kind of all Zoomed out these days. I know I am, but it was uh, it was a great, a great uh, format for getting that many people together. Um, half of which I've never met in person. So it was it was very interesting. Uh, the breakout sessions that Scott talked about were amazing. Um, it gave us a time to have just a few people in, in each room to bounce ideas off of each other. And um, there were questions that uh, members were asking each other, getting clarification on stuff that maybe we just went over and somebody didn't quite understand. And so it was, it was great. Um, I, I was very privileged to be part of such an amazing group. I think the um, the diversity in in the membership of, of this committee really represented uh, the, the demographics of Milwaukee itself. So I, I was really happy about that, um, and I was just uh, very proud to to serve on the committee and and be here for this presentation to the city council and to Mayor Gamma. So thank you. Thank you. And just as a reminder, since we just had our MRC meeting, Donna will be serving on the Community Advisory Committee for the, the Redevelopment Commission. So thank you in advance, Donna. You're welcome. <laughs> well, wait, I, I'm going to reserve that you're welcome until later. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> and and uh, I said it earlier, but I just want to underscore again, it really is an amazing group we had. Um, and we have a couple of little thank you things that we'll be distributing to the committee, a certificate signed by the mayor. And, uh, and so thank you, Donna, and thank you to all members of the committee who joined us. And we, we kind of commiserated, you know, it was a group that we were able to check in with each other after the ice storm. We all bemoaned how we survived together. Wildfires. Wildfires, I mean, there was a thought that since the committee was formed, there had been a number of natural disasters and perhaps it's for the best that it's adjourning. <laughs> I don't want to give much credence to that, but uh, anyway, it, it was a great committee and Allison and I, it was a ple pleasure to work with them all. So one of the other questions I had was um, when you let out an RFP, I mean, and it's typically, you know, three weeks or four weeks or maybe six weeks. I don't know what you're thinking here about the period of time. But I've been thinking some of the uses that I have heard people interested in, like an art center, are the kind of things that take some people um, time to pull together a plan and time to pull together the resources to pull it off. Is there anything we can and should be doing ahead of the actual RFP to be sort of laying the groundwork and letting people know that they can start, you know, yeah. pulling plans together. Yeah, I think kind of a robust community engagement process is one of our best tools for that, just kind of getting the word out there. So if you're hearing about it now or reading a pilot article now um, that you know City Hall is going to be for sale or for lease, you can, you can start getting organized well before the RFP hits the street. It would be, it would be good to get that information out broader than just Milwaukee, you know? Yeah. Really good to. I don't know what it would take to to get, you know, the Oregonian to do a story or, 
you know, one of the TV stations or something so that we get, you know, people all over the Portland metro region sort of thinking about it. It's a great idea. I can work with our communication staff on like a broader communications plan. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, I, and I'm sorry, I think this was in the notes from one of the meetings, so this is just me not fully recalling. Um, under the as-is option, tenants paying all expenses, including maintenance, that, that's a pretty big bill, right? Because it's the maintenance is $180,000 a year. Is there additional deferred maintenance that would also be folded into that, or are we only uh, considering that to be the the annual maintenance cost? That's a good question. I think if we had, you know, someone who's seriously considering a lease, it would still be, you know, a, a lease negotiation process. But kind of the message I've heard loud and clear from you guys and from um, our city leadership is that we don't have a budget going forward for the city hall building. So we'd want um, at least a lease that can cover its own costs. Yeah, and I guess, um, it was sort of a backwards way of, of asking, uh, can the building really be leased as is? Or do we have projects that are that are deferred maintenance that are big enough that they would really make it hard for, uh, for someone to lease it for 10 years and, um, you know, not have something terrible happen, I guess. <laughs> Right, that's a that's a good point. Um, Damien's has a um, facilities uh, report that kind of looks at what projects should be done over the next ten years. So we could, um, you know, when we're looking at what a lease rate is and what the city would need to see coming off the building to, um, you know, keep it whole. And maybe Anne has something to share too. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make sure that people know that those were not funded. Um, the list was not funded in the last budget. Uh, so the, there are no plans at this time to make those repairs and those improvements. They would have to be recoup costs. Costs, sorry. Thanks. Um, nobody else has a question I do. Um, can you elaborate a little bit? It uh, says create, uh, no, historic preservation project that maintains the historic character defining features of the exterior of the building facade. Um, that's a pretty open description. I mean, did the, did the committee set parameters, you know, that the, I mean, or are we planning to try and do that in the grading mechanism? I'm trying to wrap my head around how, in the in the weighting of all these things, how important is what, and, and preserved how much? Mm -hmm. Allison, uh, one thing that we talked about uh, is, I think that question and the other four um, points that we that we came up with, it's going to depend on who leases it or who buys it or what they're going to put there, and and I think that would have to be part of the negotiation because we had some some committee members saying, you know, nothing should be changed. And some people didn't want the interior to be changed. And some people didn't want the sculpture garden to be gone. And so, and so it was kind of all over the place. And I think until we know what what's going to be there, it's really hard to say how far would we want them to go. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, there are going to have to be some parameters in place in the beginning, but... Well, particularly, I mean, these RFQs, it's not like you get to sit down and have a conversation and say, oh, you're going to do that. Well, then we'll be okay with this. It's, it doesn't work that way. It's It has to be this, this scoring system that weights everything, and then people win or don't win. With the goal around historic preservation, and it, so it specifically calls out the exterior as sort of, uh, or sorry, the front facade as sort of the baseline, that that's what the committee would um, not want to see less than that preserved. <laughs> so, um, 
and the the term historic character defining features was um, emphasized for us by one of our members who has a background in historic preservation. So that's sort of a, a term in the historic preservation world that they'd want to see the front facade of the building look pretty much the same, but then flexible for the interior to change or the um, exterior, the other three sides. So is that a term that architects and developers are also familiar with, or just historians? Um, I, I think architects are familiar with it, but I'm not an architect. <laughs> Um, yeah, so talk a little bit more about the scoring. Have, have you determined sort of a scoring system, or is that still a work in progress? I'd say it's still a work in progress, and um, what I'd like to do with the proposed goals on our next Engage Milwaukee exercise is kind of go through a similar exercise as we did with the um, City Hall Blue Ribbon Committee. So ask the community which of these goals is most important to them, and that can all be reflected in our, our scoring matrix. I noticed you had them in one order in your staff report and in a different order on your slide. Is there anything um, you read into that? Uh, the, uh, someone had suggested that we put them in the order from the priority, and so it's just the ones that are in these slides is the, the priority of the committee. It's, it's quite possible the report was written before our fifth and final meeting and we were just getting our, getting our ducks in a row and then when we did the prioritization, the report just didn't get updated. And then we thought, hey, let's put it that way in the slideshow because people will ask, so. Can we see that slide again then? Yeah. The first two were flipped between them. The historic preservation was first in the staff report and is second on the the first two were flipped. Uh, minority and women contracted the third from the committee. And was moved up, yes, yes. So you asked for comments on the goals. I mean, I think they're great goals. I think they've done a nice job. To me, the historic preservation is as important as, yeah, is number one or, or tied for number one. Yeah, those um, are to me. Yeah. When when the scoring was going on, I'm I'm recalling there were a few few members who gave like a heavy heavy weight to either create a destination or historic preservation. There was mild broad support for the other three. You know, generally they were all in favor of that, but a couple of folks weighted heavily towards destination. A couple of folks weighted heavily towards preservation. So. I think it's fair to say that they're they're the top two, <laughs> far and away. Not that the other three aren't in any way important, but um, yeah. And I want to I want to add at least in the conversations that I was there for because you know I only stepped in for the the last few after um, you know for taking you know to kind of taking over as the city council liaison. There was a pretty broad. You know, I think, Allison, you mentioned, or I'm sorry, Don, I think you mentioned what historic preservation meant to members of the committee. There was a pretty broad spectrum there. Um, and so for some members, you know, it meant that it was literally just the facade, just the facade. That's all they cared about. Um, and, for, you know, for, for some others that, you know, we, like, like Donna suggested, there were some folks that don't want to see it. You know, the building changed at all. Um, and so I think that if, you know, depending on where this, where that ends up, I really think that we need to be um, kind of pretty clear, I guess, about what that means, you know, for folks who are, who are bidding. Um, because I think like, like the mayor suggested, you know, having heard the feedback from the committee, I kind of knew what that meant, or at least I thought I knew what that meant. But now I'm sort of real, like realizing, you know, that it, someone's interpretation could be just as about as broad as, you know, well, I mean, we could poll the members of this, of our council, you know, what would that mean for you? You know, what does historic preservation of this, of this building mean for you? And I think we'd have a pretty broad spectrum there too. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So I do think, I mean, you're, 
you're talking about going back to your timeline, it's going back out on Engage Milwaukee before, and we'll see a list of goals again after that. Yeah, that's when we would then, um, and hopefully we'll also have um, talk to the North Clackamas School District, and then that's when we would come back with a, a resolution with goals. So I do think, I mean, because it is because of the scoring issue. I mean, I think I agree with Councillor Falconer that we have to be kind of maybe more precise at that point about what we mean by historic preservation. Yeah. And, and I, I would, I almost um, uh, because we had such a broad response, even on the committee, to what that means. I'm wondering if we need to think about how it's presented on Engage Milwaukee too, in part because I don't, I don't want to, uh, or, and I know some of it's inevitable, but I, I would really hope we can do this in a way that doesn't uh, set up some community members to expect one outcome and then they, they feel like it doesn't deliver, you know? So I think the language we use around historic preservation, even when we're doing out the second uh, round of outreach on uh, Engage Milwaukee needs to be really well considered and clear. Yeah, and I, I mean, all of these are, are ish, right? There's maintains open space. Well, is that an all or nothing? Like all the trees come down, the, the, the sculpture garden goes away. Um, well, that's a zero, and uh, so if, if they were keeping half the trees, if they were keeping the sculpture garden, I mean, if, then I think we're going to, the system, how we score this is going to be really important and really have to be thought through. And, and I would actually like to see a draft of the scoring mm -hmm. before it goes out, because I think it can make a world of difference. And I think. You know, that's that's the hard part about these kinds of processes. It is not a conversation where you can go, well, keeping these three trees is really important to us. Can you shift the design to do this and that? And then, oh, sure, we could do that. You know, you, you don't get that opportunity for back and forth. Um, and we saw, I don't know if any of you know this, but just our conversations with Waverly caused them to redesign the road up there. So it's saving a whole bunch of oak trees. But that conversation had to take place before that. So there's, you know, RFQ processes are hard when you have something that there's a lot of emotionality around. There's a lot of uh, various concerns and various levels of concerns about the various things because there's no conversation. It's so that gets me to wonder, do we have to do an RFP or do we have, to, you know, how are there other processes? And I'm re remembering when the Monroe Harrison lot was previously uh, the subject of development proposals and the city actually had three development proposals that it did have public meetings about and it did present and have conversations about. Could we use an RFP to get us to three and then, but not say we're going to select from it, maybe, or something like that. Is there some sort of hybrid model where not everything rides on a single RFP? In my experience, um, you know, we kind of get to define the selection process. So I've done um, interviews with, um, you know, you, if we got 10 proposals, then we'll take the top two and do interviews with the selection committee. I think that could, there's always sort of a balance of how much you ask for um, before someone's selected. And then once there is a selected proposal, that's when it can look more like a, a negotiation. Layla popped, popped out of thin air. Just out of thin air. I've been here listening in the background. Um, I just would add that I think we're using kind of two terms 
terms interchangeably do. We have an RFQ process, which is a different kind of process and isn't proposal heavy. So it's more like qualifications, generally what are you planning to do? And then, um, and I think that's the process that we're describing here. And then you go through negotiation. And there may be ways, as Allison described, to, um, sorry, my dog thinks I'm talking to him, um, to have a little bit more transparency about what that looks like. Um, which we can talk about. An RFP process is a, a kind of next level. And I think what you're referring to, Councillor Beatty, is back when we did the Harrison and Maine side. This is, I was actually at Metro at the time. I was about 12 years ago. They did a full on RFP. And that's where actually the, the proposer actually does a pretty in depth study. And they cost quite a lot of money. And so I just think that we need to be cognizant of that, that if we do kind of take an RFP approach, especially if we want it to be equitable, we want folks that maybe don't have kind of the bankroll in order to do a more sophisticated proposal. So that's where I think the RFQ approach is a little more equitable because it's a lower barrier to entry for folks. And then you kind of negotiate what happens after. So that was the only point I wanted to make is we're proposing an RFQ, not an RFP. If there is an RFP, then we should we should talk about what that looks like and how we might support um, folks to make it make it equitable. Just because sometimes we throw things around real fast. An RFP is a request for proposal. It's a more in-depth proposal that you bring forward into a selection process. A request for qualifications is an RFQ. And that's where we say, show us that you could do this generally. We've set some, some base guidelines and then we talk to you about what it looks like. So um, we did an RFQ, I believe, on, on COHO. Is that right, Layla? Mm -hmm. And then we've done an RFP uh, usually when so I did an RFP when we were hiring the architect for the library. So it was more exact what we were looking for. We knew we wanted a specific outcome. Uh, we needed qualified firms and the qualifications were pretty high already just to en as an entrance to the, the uh, competition. Sorry for interrupting, Councillor Beatty. So can you do an RFQ, which that makes sense to me that that's where you start, um, but not have one outcome, not have one selectee be the outcome, but have two or three and have sort of more of an engagement around what those two or three would do and uh, not be locked into the one that comes out high, scoring highest on the RFQ. It can, I say right now. <laughs> experience of both usually I'll have the selection committee um, all fill out the score sheets and then we'll use those score sheets to have a conversation um, and then usually it comes down to okay do we want to bring someone in for interviews um, and you know do we have a top two or three um, proposers that we want to have a conversation with so I think it it can it can be flexible well, and I think part of why we did the community engagement process the way we did this time was actually to get more detail from the community about what they were looking for in the process as a whole. Um, when we had first started talking about this way back when, we were thinking that this would happen after we knew more about the property. We were asked by the school district to start this process sooner and to try and get some of these answers before we walked into this um, into now the request for proposal. So we we ended up getting a lot of the information in this process that we would have normally got through an RFQ process later on if we had gone about it that way. I'm not saying one way or the other is the right or the wrong way, but I do wanna make sure that the work that the committee has done remains the qualifications and the decision basis for the actions that we take moving forward because they spent so much time on it. Um, so that is my only ask is whatever the process is that we determine that it doesn't change the goals uh, based on the feedback unless council wants to change the goals now, but I don't want to accidentally change them by creating a process that undermines those values that were put forward in the process. Does that make sense? That seems like the values are right. It's a question of how much of which ones, right? And that ends up then becoming a negotiation. And, and what they mean, I mean. Yeah. Uh, 
totally get that. Um, and I think that there are definitely, yeah, there's, as we talked about tonight, there's a lot of wiggle room within those, especially those top two and then the next three about how those are perceived in this process. So I, I'm, I don't think we're predetermined. If you'd like, once we put these up and we receive further feedback from the community, we can have the discussion about the type of process that you all want to go through. I'm only doing, saying that now because it's 540, um, and I try and give you all at least a few minutes to eat some food before we go into our next meeting, and I think it's a way for us to push the rest of this conversation into that decision point. Okay. Okay. So any, any other last things that anybody has to say before we... No? All right. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything, and thank you, Scott and Allison. Excellent work, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Scott and Allison, thank you. counselors Donna. who are involved. Uh, Donna and your, the rest of your committee, thank you very much. It was great work. You guys came out with a really good list of thoughts and uh, look forward to the process. Thank you. All right, so we will see you, most of you back here in uh, 